Hi guys, it is a gorgeous spring day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization down here in the great state of Texas. But we're going to head up to British Columbia, Canada, where I have the great pleasure and honor of talking to wildlife biologist Neil Dahl. And for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Neil's name, we, we, need to, we need to bring Neil's name closer to the forefront here. Neil is a registered professional biologist in British Columbia. He retired from the Canadian Wildlife Service Environment Canada in 2006 after 31 years in civil service on Vancouver Island managing national wildlife areas and migratory bird sanctuaries and working to protect migratory birds and their habitat. Um, <clears throat> Neil has written over 80 scientific, technical, and popular papers and articles on birds, ecology, and the environment. Today, he is the president of the Qualicum Institute, which we will talk about later in this interview. And his primary interest today focus on the two limiting factors affecting biodiversity conservation on the Earth today. Human population growth and per capita consumption. So, Neil Dahl, come, come on and say hello to the folks and then we'll just dive right into this conversation. Well, hello to everybody that's listening, and uh, it's a, a beautiful sunny day here in British Columbia as well, Sam, so we got two things going for us. All right, uh, a beautiful sunny day in, in early April in Vancouver, I think that's a good thing. So anyway, guys, I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm gonna tell a little story on, on, on Neil. Uh, on our email exchange when I was inviting him to appear on uh, here on the show, uh, I, I told him I wanted to talk about such things as the collapse of bird populations and unsustainable palm oil, so on and so forth, and he, he wrote back to me politely declining this interview Looking at the questions you plan on asking, I am definitely the wrong person to interview. For the past five to ten years, I have been ignoring information on what are essentially symptoms such as animal population collapse and palm oil issues. And I, I, I begged Neil to reconsider because he really piqued my curiosity, and I am very happy to say he has agreed to this interview, but I don't know where we're going to go. So, Neil Dahl, if you have been ignoring information on what are essentially symptoms, obviously you have been concentrating on the bigger picture. So, uh, just dive in and tell us what you have had on your mind for the past five or ten years. Uh, as we move through the 21st century here on planet Earth. Take it away. Okay. Well, I probably shouldn't say I've said uh, or tight uh, ignoring, but, but I haven't been paying that, that much attention to, to the what I call symptomatic issues, uh, things like the palm oil issue and its impact on orangutan and other populations. and. Uh, Migratory, migratory bird population declines and, and, and the like, because um, I've been focusing on these symptoms for well over 50 years. I mean, th think of all the environmental organizations that are around the planet, all of the environmentalists um, working to deal with issues such as declines in wildlife populations. And the planet is in, a, in the worst shape it's ever been. So. What we've been doing hasn't worked, and yet we keep doing the same thing over and over. We keep talking about cleaning up streams and, and uh, protecting wildlife habitat. Uh, we keep reminding the public that the main reason for declines in wildlife populations is loss of habitat. 
as if that habitat is spontaneously disappearing around the planet. And we still didn't bring up the fact or ask the question, why, why is, what is driving that habitat loss? And so we started looking at this uh, at the, at the Golikan Institute, uh, among other places. I mean, I began thinking about this quite a few years ago as working as a wildlife biologist and noting that all the work and, and effort that we've gone to in the past uh, simply hasn't been effective. And so I came to the conclusion that we needed an organization that, that would uh, start to deal with this. I mean, and we'll get into the into the Qualicum Institute, or QI as we call it, uh, a bit later. But after looking at a lot of research on the subject, it became very clear to me that, that the, the drivers of wildlife population declines and uh, other environmental issues, and in fact social issues, um, were population growth and growth in per capita consumption. And those two drivers are wrapped up in two words, and that's economic growth. In virtually every country on the planet, their goal is to increase economic growth. Yeah. And of course, on a finite planet with finite resources, uh, that can't be done without major impacts. So that's what we've we've tried to focus on. Uh, how to deal with how to get uh, the general public and the politicians to realize that um, we need to move to what's called a steady state economy, an economy that's in balance with the regenerative and assimilative capacity of the biosphere. And if we don't do that, and it doesn't look like we're going to. Um, all these issues that you've been talking about, Sam, uh, are the result. And uh, as they pointed out in Limits to Growth back in 1972, uh, collapse is the end result of that. So, but before we get, get into what we are going to do about this uh, from a political, geopolitical standpoint, um, define your definition of, of collapse, both in terms of when and what it's going to look like. This is Collapse Chronicles, so stare into your, <laughs> stare into your crystal ball and define your definition of collapse for our listeners. Well, uh, I unfortunately don't have a crystal ball, but what I do know is that uh, if we keep doing what we're doing in terms of impacting biodiversity. See, economic growth is an increase, an increase in the production and consumption of goods and services in the aggregate, which means that every year that has to increase in order for us to grow the economy. Well, these goods and services don't come from thin air. They come from ecosystems. So you can also look at economic growth as an increase in throughput of, of natural resources uh, to the economy, which creates the stuff that we buy, and then back to the back to the ecosystems that is waste, eventually. Um, the ecosystems themselves and the resources that we take from them come from the structure of these ecosystems, which affects all the organisms that are dependent upon the ecosystems themselves, and this is why wildlife populations are declining. I mean, you just have to look around at any development that once was a forested area, and we've got a number of them here on, the, on Vancouver Island, where literally millions of organisms uh, lived out their daily lives in this small patch of forest, and then it's clear-cut and a bunch of houses are put up upon it, and they're gone. Yeah. They're absolutely gone from, from the environment. And we're essentially, to we're totally dependent on ecosystems. And it, it, the thing that, that I see missing from a lot of biologists talking about these, these population declines are the, um, 
is the fact that they're not just cute, cuddly little creatures, that, that it would be a shame if we lost them. It's all of these organisms simply living out their daily lives that facilitate the ecosystem functions, which provide the life support ecosystem services that keep us and every other organism, or organism on the planet alive. And so every time we impact an ecosystem, we reduce those services and reduce the, the, um, the, the life support services that they provide. If we keep doing that, and uh, <clears throat> many ecologists now are saying that we need to protect 50% of all the ecosystems on the planet. Well, there's some ecosystems we can't do that. For example, the coastal Douglas Spur Zone on Vancouver Island, there's only about 1% of it left in its natural state here. So if we have to keep 50%, um, we're going to have we're going to have a lot of trouble. And, and the more we impact these ecosystems and the organisms within them, the less resilience they have, and the less resilience they have could cause them to flip. And if that occurs, it uh, could be a, uh, an unfortunate situation for human beings. So when you, when you say flip, I, I mean, is, is, what what is your view of this? Is is you've probably heard of this term, the Seneca cliff, that is kind of like a roller coaster that goes click 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 up the hill and then and then dives over. Is it gonna be a? Are we just gonna go right about business as usual and then just and, and is it gonna be? I mean, is it gonna be a hit the wall? And over the cliff, or is this, uh, or is it going to be uh, just a spiraling down of the ecosystems and the concomitant social fabric of humanity? Or how is, how is your view on, on that? I have to say, I really don't know. Um, it could be either. Um, if if the ecosystems flip, as I call it, change to another form. And, and this, is a this is a sort of a natural function of the ecosystems. Uh, it's, the theory is called panarchy, where they, there's a growth spurt and then a leveling off. And then there's an actual collapse of the, of the structure of the system. And you think of a forest fire, or forest, rather. The fire moves through it. it it's gone through the growth phase. There's a, a, essentially a partial collapse of the system with the fire. And then there's a regeneration and a rebuild, and it, and it starts the process all over. What we're doing, though, is, uh, as an example, we're, we've been fighting these fires. And so year after year, the buildup of uh, the debris causes tremendous fires to, to, to burn. And in some instances, causes the it, it causes an inability of the forest to regenerate, and that's sort of what we're doing with our system through economic growth and, and technology, where we we should have probably collapsed or had a minor collapse years ago. We've been putting that off, and so the chances are that a collapse when it occurs is going to be a major collapse. And I always, Never. I always ask timelines. Do you, uh, do you, do you play that game, the the timeline game, or? No, I don't. Uh, particularly with ecosystems, because uh, they're so resilient. Number one, and number two, our technology allows us to push push past these these um, natural natural small collapses. Uh, so yeah, I don't I don't like to play the timeline game. There's one other factor too that that uh, that is tied in with this, and uh, so I, I guess one one form of collapse could could be ecological. The other form of collapse could be economic, and uh, because it our our current economic system demands economic growth. Yeah. I'll just give you one example. Um, money creation. Virtually all our money is created through debt. So you go out and get a loan, 
and the money wasn't there before, it's credited to your account, and all of a sudden the money's created by the banks out of thin air. They don't have this, uh, that, they don't lend you money that people have deposited in savings. They just simply create it out of thin air. <clears throat> but you owe it back to them with interest. And they don't create the interest. Okay, so where does the interest come from? Well, it comes from the money that's already been created and out in the economy. But remember, all that money, or virtually all of it, has been created through debt. So it's all owed back, plus interest. It so is a crazy system. All, only humans could have come up with this one. Uh... Well, exactly. It's, it's <laughs> absolutely nuts, because the only way that the, the system works is a lot of repossessions and bankruptcies, because if people can't pay the interest, they lose their home or whatever. And they lose it because you were able to pay your interest. But the other factor, I guess, is the um, the other factor that, that keeps the money going and the economy going is economic growth. Because if you keep growing, then there's more money to be borrowed mm -hmm. and more money is put into the system. If that stops, then there's no money to pay the interest, and the system would collapse. So, do you are, do you see the economic? Is this going to be the economic collapse? Is is going to trigger the ecological or the economic collapse? Is actually going to help uh, prevent the ecological collapse, or is this all tied? Is it so tied in together? that you can't really separate the economic and the social and the ecological, that it's so much contributing from all parts. Well, if there was an economic collapse, it would certainly help the ecosystems because that, may, that would mean we'd stop growing and uh, stop intruding into them. But, uh, and again, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. I just know that you you can't keep growing forever on a finite planet with finite resources. It's an impossibility, and yet somehow neoclassical economists have convinced virtually all of us that this is a... You know, you stop and think about it. We had with the uh, Brundtland Commission a sustainable development. We're going to have sustainable development. This is fantastic. And they even mentioned we could have a tenfold increase tenfold increase in economic growth. <laughs> oh, yeah. And everybody would be lifted, you know, or the rising tide lifts all boats and all that stuff. Um, of course, they didn't factor in that, that we were, at that time, we were already um, appropriating something like between 25 and 40 percent of the net primary productivity of the planet. So, if you take the smaller amount, 25%, if we increased our economic growth fourfold, we would be appropriating all the net primary productivity. That can't, that can't happen. So certainly 10% was ridiculous. But then, uh, I guess, cracks started appearing, and economists said, well, maybe sustainable development. Uh, that's not the right word. Uh, well, I know. Sustainable growth. We'll have sustainable growth. <laughs> is there uh, such a thing as sustainable growth and sustainable development? Are those, are those complete oxymorons for the 21st century? Well, sustainable development may not be because there's qualitative development. There's development that you grow um, qualitatively, right? But uh, sustainable de growth is... is de is in terms of material things is definitely not uh, an oxymoron. And then for some reason or other, we uh, switched from sustainable growth because there was so much criticism about it, to smart growth. You know, yes. we're, gonna grow, we're gonna grow smartly. And, um, but that didn't seem to work either. I remember, uh, I think it was Al Bartlett said, smart growth is like, uh, like uh, getting the booking on the Titanic. You can grow. You can go smart and uh, go first class, or you can grow dumb and grow steerage. <laughs>
he was, was a great was. guy. We 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 miss we miss Al. I am so sorry. I never got a chance to talk to that man. Yeah, uh, one, one, one of my heroes. Well, uh, but before we well, get a, one, okay. one, one more thing, Sam. Sure. We're, we, we've lost the smart growth thing now. Now we're at green growth. Oh yes. We're going to grow green now, and we're going to decouple <laughs> resources and energy from the economy, so that we can keep growing. You know, all of these things that haven't worked, and 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 we're still. You know, <laughs> they keep coming up amazing. with, but but the the second word always remains the same, which is growth. They keep changing the modifier before the uh, before the term growth, and uh, anybody with a brain just has to shake their head in uh, in dismay. Uh, I just want to, since we're good lord, since we're already w over a third of the way through this. Uh, before we get into the geopolitical challenge, you, you mentioned technology and, and how technology can, can barely keep us held together with bubble gum and duct tape, as I call it, over these what should have been collapses along the way. Uh, but on, but I'm going to take a wild guess that you are not a, a techno optimist that thinks uh, technology is, is, is going to keep us from the big kahuna collapse. Is that true? Or? No. Yeah, I, I, uh, that is true. I don't, I don't think technology can do it. Um, there's a climate scientist in Britain by the name of Kevin Anderson, and he's been talking about this for years, pointing out that um, a lot of these um, solutions to climate change involve uh, not only reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, but technological solutions to these. Uh, and he emphasizes that none of these have been proven, and particularly none of them have been shown to work at scale, at the scale we need yeah. to. So, yeah, that's um, this, this, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of people, a lot smarter than me, that are saying, you know, but the, smart, the smart thing to do is to, to stop what we're doing. And it's going to be tough because it means a major change in the system, but particularly in the economic system. But um, it, it, that, from my perspective, here's our choice. Change the, what we're doing to live in balance with the regenerate, regenerative and assimilative capacity of the biosphere, or get the boot. And nature will, she doesn't care. It's not the planet that needs saving. Planet, he's, it's been around for four billion years. Life's been around for about 3.8. Um, she'll just give us the boot, continue on her way, and uh, a new form of organism will crawl to the outer limbs of the evolutionary shrub, and they'll continue. And, 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 the, the difference is uh, we won't be here watching. No, no, uh, Neil, we will not. Okay, well, that was, I figured it would be a pretty short discussion about about techno-optimism, but let's uh, turn the discussion to the political will on this planet. Uh, you know, first, first we had to suffer the election of Donald Trump, and then for the few people on the planet who were watching the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which I consider to be one of the single biggest threats to the planet that nobody is talking about, uh, that's, you know, coming out of China. And then we had this guy, Bolsonaro, win the election in Brazil. And now we have that guy protecting the Amazon rainforest. And it's just like, a, just between those three guys in the U.S., China, and Brazil. And, and don't even talk about Narendra Modi over there in India. Uh, you know, how, how are we going to get the message through to these dolts that, that what they're doing is basically uh, threatening all life on on planet Earth by their by their crazy uh, whatever thoughts go through their head. How are we going to get through to these guys? Well, there's the question of the century, isn't it? Um, 
that was one thing that, that, that we're, we're sort of focusing on on the Colican Institute. We realized that uh, we used to give a lot of presentations, and um, maybe we can talk about the, the Institute now, because uh, yeah. I don't want to keep popping back and forth. Yeah, but tell us a little bit about that and how yeah, you're approaching this problem. Well, it was, uh, we formed the, the QI um, to essentially deal with sustainability issues because we felt that, and, and local sustainability issues, because we felt that local governments on um, Vancouver Island didn't, under, didn't truly understand what it meant to be sustainable. They all, all mentioned it in their official community plans and, um, but, and their growth reports and so on, sustainable growth reports. Um, but they didn't seem to really understand what it was like. So we formed the Quality Institute to try to get that message out to the people. And our, our, our indicator was any, any report you read, if it mentions continued economic growth, they, they don't understand sustainability. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And so we started giving these presentations and we gave them to governments and so on. And we kept getting the argument that, well, the Canadian Constitution says you can't stop people from coming here, so, you know, you can't stop growth. Arguments like that. Um, then we, we realized that, that these presentations that we were giving were essentially just entertainment. Either we were talking to the choir when we were asked to give a presentation, or uh, it was just the form of of entertainment for, for a corporation. And, uh, so we, we decided, okay, we've got to start looking into this a little more because what is what is really the issue that's stopping us from, from making these changes? We know what to do. We've got the science that's telling us what to do. Um, and so undoubtedly, it's, it's our human nature. You know, we're geared to react to the attack of a saber-toothed tiger, uh, to providing food for us immediately, but we're not geared to react to the monsoons that are going to come in August and September or climate change. And that's part of the problem. How, how, do we, how do we get the people to react to something like climate change that's far off in the distance? How do we get them to realize that it's actually now it's occurring now, and then how do we get them to act? And and by act, I mean talk to their politicians about it. And and I think we're learning something from that little sixteen-year-old girl in in Sweden. I think it is. Yeah. Greta Thunberg. 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 Something like that. Do you? Uh... Yeah, she's doing everything. She's doing everything wrong. You know. I mean, we. We uh, we were often told, oh, you yeah, know, you don't want to scare your audience. Uh, you can't say that because it's too controversial. Uh, do you know what I mean? And so we couched all our terms for for years. And here, this little gal gets up and says, you know, I'm not here to expect you to do anything. You haven't done anything for 50 years. Why would I expect you to do anything? I'm just here to tell you we're going to do something. <laughs> I think she's got it right, and she's got a major following, a major movement, and I, somehow that's what we have to do. We have to get, because politicians don't lead, they follow. We've got to get the, the general public to recognize that uh, this is an extremely serious issue, and uh, how we do that, I'm not sure. We're trying a variety of things, and so one of the things we're thinking of doing is putting up a bunch of PSAs on social media. Really short, you know, thirty-second to one-minute pieces that that hit hard. And uh, but again, we, we have no idea if it's going to work because the general public hears every day, virtually every day, on TV and the radio that we got to grow the economy. Yeah. You know, it's uh, 
It's the economy, so stupid. Have, uh, you know, that's it. It's the economy. Every election cycle, every single election cycle, the same is going to happen in 2020. We know it. We look at the yeah. number one issue that, that voters are concerned about. It's the economy, the very last issue. Uh, on the yeah. list of, of like the top ten issues is going to be the environment. It was it, it was the same in 2016, and it's going to be the same in 2020. That we can't maybe with the climate change thing will get the environment from ten to nine. I don't know, but but it, but the economy so overwhelms all other issues uh, that I, you know just chipping away at this juggernaut. I just. I, I don't know what to do. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty we're, hopeless. We're just we're just trying a variety of things, and we don't really know what to do either, to be honest with you. But uh, you know, it's 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 difficult from a, a number of perspectives. But one is that they keep hearing economic growth is we need it. You know, we got to have it. And uh, so, if you try to start talking about uh, a steady state economy, which is a sustainable economy, um, the argument comes back, well, what are you talking about? There's nothing wrong with our economy. We just have to grow it, and we can grow our way out of anything. So, yeah, they, these are really difficult issues. And that, it, interestingly, we, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in Canada uh, over the next couple of weeks. We just had a report released by Environment and Climate Change Canada on climate change. Yeah. Yesterday, I think it was, or today, maybe it was today. It was, it was leaked yesterday and released today. And they've shown that Canada's global temperature increase, or sorry, Canada's temperature increase is twice that of the global increase. So global temperatures have, have increased about a degree of 0.8 Celsius, I think it is. Canada's seen an increase of 1.7 degrees Celsius, more than double the global average. And of course, it's happening faster in the Arctic, as we yeah. know. It's I think over two degrees in the Arctic. And if if the this report says if the, if the global emissions are dramatically reduced, okay, that that means serious. You know, they've got to be down to zero by 2050, if not sooner. So that means stopping an increase right now. Uh, the average temperature will rise only three degrees Celsius. Now, three degrees. Remember, three fifty dot org. Yeah, that 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 uh, anachronistic uh, name, three fifty. We'll never yeah. see three fifty again. Three fifty dot org. That was supposed to keep us below two degrees Celsius. Well, uh, February, the CO two at the Mono Law was uh, four eleven. Yeah. Four eleven parts per million. <laughs> You know, there's no way we're going to stop it, too. And look what's happening at, at one. I mean, it's, and, you know, it's it's absolutely insane. So three degrees isn't going to be very nice in Canada. But if we fail to act aggressively, if we fail to do something right now, the projected increase is seven to nine degrees. We won't be here. There's no way. I don't think there's any way that vertebrates can seven degrees. <laughs> so, but but again, how you get people to? I mean, people should be marching in the street over this, and that's what Greta's trying to do. Which I, you know, I really admire that young young gal. But what people but, uh, are marching in the streets about is an increase in the fuel tax. That that gasoline is more expensive. That's, right. that, that, that's what gets people out marching in the streets is when you raise your yep. gasoline. So, are you expecting the Canadian government to get hold of this latest report and immediately shut down the oil, uh, the tar sands oil projects uh, in in response to this report? Is that going to happen, Neil? I don't. No, I doubt it very much. They're they're fighting. Uh, a lot of the provinces are fighting the carbon tax that the federal government is trying to implement. And in fact, if uh, if the province if the provinces don't like British Columbia has a carbon tax already. Um, if the provinces don't implement their own carbon tax, then the federal government will impose one on them, and uh, that went into effect Monday. 
But even even I'm not sure of the carbon tax. There's a lot of uh, a lot of concern that it may not work. And in fact, uh, here in Canada, households receive a rebate check from the federal government to offset the expenses. But the added tax applies. Well, you know, if you know that you're going to get it's going to cost you more at the pump, but you're going to get a rebate in December. <laughs> uh, but what? Uh, uh, yeah. I, I'm not a politician, but I don't get it. Uh, you know. I want to uh, d d d just for the the interest of time. I want to get your, your your reaction to the United Nations. Just uh, the, the, I see a pretty schizophrenic organization here. I'm particularly looking at the 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 last climate talks and that environmental uh, meeting they had over there in Nairobi. So both the, the, these last two big meetings of the UN, it seems to me that the science, that the scientist end of it, it, it is good and and they're bringing out these more and more and more dire reports and, 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 and bringing these as is Greta Thunberg to the to the United Nations but then on the, of course on the other end uh, the, the UN you have the sustainable development goals and all this is the United Nations which appears to be the biggest global political reaction to the ecological crisis is is it up to the challenge of uh, of fixing this how do you rate their performance and and what is wrong with the UN and are they going to save the save the biosphere well i don't think they're going to save it with their sustainable development goals because right in those goals they're talking about economic growth yeah. and, and not not just specific to the poor nations. I mean, we do have to bring them up. But, you know, there's so many... Like, we talk about overpopulation. Um, I just did a off-the-edge-of-the-desk calculation and, and ran it by the, um, the ecological footprint people just to see if I was within the ballpark, and they agreed. Um, if you take our ecological footprint, Canada's at eight global hectares per person. I think the U.S. is something like nine or ten yeah. global hectares per person. Um, Zambia is one, and Europe's about four and a half. So that global hectares per person means that in order to keep the average European at the standard of living to which he's accustomed or she's accustomed, um, you need four and a half hectares of want, productive land and water somewhere on the planet. I just want to interject for our American uh, listeners, that is two, a hectare is two and a half acres. Anyway, right. just, yeah, go, go ahead. So when you hear hectare, you got to multiply by two and a half to, uh, get, get, to get how many acres he's talking about here. Anyway, keep go on with that thought. So um, if you do the calculations, you want a sustainable population. If you have the standard of living of Zambia, for example, at one global hectare per person, you could have a population of 13 billion people on the planet. And it would support them. But you'd be living at the Zambian standard of living. Uh, if, if, if you had... Uh, a sustainable population at Canada's global hectare use, which is eight global hectares, you'd have a, popu uh, a sustainable population of about one. One billion. One, one to two billion. Right? So do and the Europe, math. Uh, Euro Europeans, you, you, you could have three, three to four billion. Based on ecological footprint analysis, we're at 7.6 billion right now, and and we want to bring up the poorer nations. We we want equity in in, in the earth's resource use. Uh, they've got to grow a bit because economic growth does bring bring you up. But the one thing people f forget to mention is, I mean, you can have a, a continuously improving.
I mean, Steven Pinker talks about this, that uh, everything seems to be getting better. You know, we've got, we live longer, we've got better health care, um, a variety of things, uh, less crime and so on. And wh what he forgets is that, that you can have a, continu a continuously improving standard of living while at the same time you're destroying the very source of that standard of living, the ecosystems of the planet. And that's exactly what we're doing. You know, it's like a person with a million bucks in the bank getting 5% in interest. He can live on 50000 a year forever. But if he decides, I'm going to have a better standard of living, I'm going to live on $55,000 yeah. a year, he runs out of money in 50 years. And, and that's essentially what we're doing. We're running out of ecosystems and the natural resources. Well, since, since, since you brought so, up the, uh, the, the, the big O word, the, the overpopulation word, I'm glad you did, so uh, I, I didn't have to uh, wedge it into this conversation. Start out, let, let, let's wrap, wrap up with the UN. Do you think the United Nations uh, in all of their environment meetings and climate meetings, do you think they are factoring in overpopulation uh, in, into their into their figures and their recommendations? I don't. I, I mean, they they brush up against the word population, but they never put the O behind it. Uh, do you th just talk about the issue of overpopulation and the political? response to it and why it's such a hot button issue that nobody except a few of us down here in this rabbit hole want to get anywhere near. So take a run on overpopulation for a few minutes. <laughs> well, I think part of it is, is, is religious, uh, religious uh, concerns. But, but also part of it, as I mentioned, the, the driver of economic growth is population growth. Yeah. You've got to have more people wanting more things, or else you've got to have the same amount of people wanting more things. But So I think that's a factor. And again, the economy is, is the major concern. You can see it in the Sustainable Development Goals when they actually mention that we're going to have uh, continued economic growth. And that's not going to happen with, without more people. It's not going to happen, yeah, exactly. It's not going to happen without more people. Yeah. And, and, and that is, is to, to me, I think, is, is the main reason that, that, that it's not being talked about. But it's just almost like, I was just interviewing, I don't know if you've heard about this outfit called Birth Strike by this singer yep. over there in uh, England. She started this thing trying to encourage people, young people, not to have children in the face of the of the environmental collapse that's building. So she, oh man, she got into it with Tucker Carlson at Fox News and all these. So anyway, but even with my interview with her a few days ago, talking to the, this woman who clearly gets it, she's not having children because she understands what her children would have to endure. But even she just wants to make sure, she wants to make sure that she is not saying that overpopulation is the problem, that overpopulation has nothing to do with it, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and my jaw just about hit the, the desk when I was interviewing her. What yeah. what is this disconnect that 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 it's the it is the last thing that people are going to face the biggest problem on the planet is the last problem we're going to get to uh, do you agree with that or yeah I think yeah, I think that's going to be a tough one I mean we we know a, an effective solution to that and that is educating the women in in the, in the third world. And, and you do that, and uh, their income increases, and uh, their productivity de decreases in terms of children. So that's that's one thing that we do know is effective. But the problem is, you know, I mean, China tried it with the one child yeah. 
thing, and people went crazy over that. Um, I don't know. It's just, uh, it's, it's a baffler to me, knowing the little I know about what's, 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 what's happening, that uh, we're not uh, taking decisive action on this. What's your and definition I, of decisive action on, on, on this problem? Define that term. I mean, I don't know what decisive action on the overpopulation pro uh, problem looks like, but it's the it's the biggest action we need to be taking on the planet right now. <clears throat> well, I think the decisive action we need to we need to hit first is that everybody or a majority have to recognize we we've got a major problem. We have to do something about it. And we want to do something about it. Because right now, I don't think I think again, most people hear politicians saying, "You know, well, we'll grow our way out of this. You know, economic growth is marvelous. Look what it's done for us now, and it has done wonders. No two ways about it. But it's also done a lot of harm and serious harm. I think that's that's the." That's the thing we've somehow got to we somehow got to confront, agree with, and start acting on. And it, it, I don't see any sign of that. Even the environmental organizations, you stop and think about them. You know, we have one in in Canada called Nature Canada, and uh, some of the, some of the groups, the um, subsidiary groups, the naturalist groups in British Columbia, have actually. Uh, taken a position statement on economic growth. That there's a fundamental conflict between economic growth and, and biodiversity conservation. And uh, they, they tried to get Nature Canada to take a position on it. They wouldn't even let it on the floor. They wouldn't let their members even discuss it. The economic growth or the overpopulation? The economic growth. Well, you I see, mean, they're that, tied. They're, yeah. one in, they're one and the same, and that's why... Yeah, yeah. I talk more about economic growth than overpopulation, but but if you agree that we've got to stop economic growth, you automatically agree that we have to deal with consumption and overpopulation. Yeah, but they but... wouldn't even let they, they wouldn't even let their members discuss it. Oh yeah, and you have to wonder is that because they get funding from corporations and corporations wouldn't like anybody talking about stopping economic growth. The, the only environmental organization I see in the U.S. is Center for Biological Diversity. They they are they're taking it on, but I mean, but everybody else and you know the World Wildlife Fund they they're coming out with their reports about the the three what is it two thirds of the animals have disappeared off this planet in the past 40 years and then they try to sell you a World Wildlife Fund panda visa card this is no joke if you haven't heard no, of this I don't. and you get no. money back the more gasoline you you buy the more yep. that the World Wildlife Fund gets to, you know, we're it's just a, it's just a hopeless mess. The the corporate takeover uh, of these big global environmental uh, organizations, these mainstream environmental organizations, it's 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 just yep. one more disheartening thing. It is, and a lot of people think they're doing a lot of wonderful, wonderful work, um, and and in some cases they are, but they're not addressing the root cause, and that's the problem. One group that is addressing the root cause is the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, and this is a group in uh, in the United States. Brian Chuck is the executive director, and uh, he's a he's a good man, a good person to talk with about about economic growth, the impacts of it, and uh, I, and, what can, and what we can do about it. I have an email out to him. I'm, wait, I'm awaiting a, a response uh, a, a response from him. So anyway, we are get, getting a little bit towards the end here. So I just want to, uh, before we wrap it up, just is there anything in this conversation that, you're, that you haven't gotten to that you would like to get to uh, for these l last few minutes? Uh... I don't know, it seems that we've covered a lot of it. And I, I think as I 
said at the beginning, I, I don't have a crystal ball, and there's, there's a lot of people a lot more knowledgeable than I, but the, unless we address this growth paradigm that we seem so stuck on, um, I, I don't see any hope for humanity, to be honest with you, and that's, that's a hard thing to state, but uh, we can't keep growing uh, on a finite planet with finite resources. It's just an impossibility, and somehow the neoclassical economists have have um, even overruled the science, which is a baffler to me, but uh, we live in a fantasy world, Sam. It's, it's, it's wishful thinking is, uh, is, it explains the bafflement to me. Uh, it's, it's magical thinking and, and uh, right. just, just thinking we can have our cake and eat it too and, and, and all the rest. So I... Uh, what the most is magical the... of all, by the way, is this new decoupling. We're going to decouple right. resource use and energy use from the economy. We're gonna make stuff out of nothing. There you well, we just three D print just three D print it. Yep. Uh, make yep. your McDonald's hamburgers in the laboratory and three D print your house. And uh, I actually uh, was uh, was trying to avoid a conversation about three D printing housing for the homeless in Austin, Texas last week. I did want to get your I, I'm, while researching this article, I found this little, this researching this interview, I found this little article of, uh, from wildland, from farmlandbirds.net, and it, the, the headline was, Wildlife Biologist Neil Dahl says he would not be surprised if the generation after him witnesses the extinction of humanity. Is that... Is that a correct summation of uh, of your views? You... Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's a quote from from uh, an interview I had quite a few years ago. I I've, I've seen nothing to change that. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, again, I don't have that crystal ball, so I'm not sure about <laughs> two generations. But if we keep doing what we're doing, yeah, we're out of here, in my opinion. So uh, let 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 let's hope Greta Thunberg uh, is, is is Greta seems to be the new uh, the, the 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 new big hope for the planet. But I mean, all joking aside, we the, the, there better be a generation of uh, of of Greta Thunbergs. I, I I mean, I don't know what her actual action plan is. But, but at least she's she's stepping up the the dialogue I, and she's ramping up the dialogue. I'm afraid she's just going to be a flash in the pan and the corporate greenwashers or uh, or, or somehow we're going to start seeing Greta's face on uh, on some new SUV the the, the, the Greta uh, e, you know uh, eco SUV or something. But anyway, you've probably already done this, but let's uh, in, in the last couple of minutes. But I always like to close my interviews with my guests, and do stay on here when when I wrap it up here in a minute. Do stay on so we can talk for a couple of minutes. But how I always wrap up is uh, with my with my guest is. If you are not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles on YouTube, but actually unbelievably had the mainstream media putting a microphone in your face in 2019, Neil Dahl, what would your 60-second soundbite to the planet sound like? Take it away. Well, I think I would just simply say, let's support Greta. <laughs> We're behind Greta. Okay, I, uh, I I I don't know if if I should have if I should have that uh, try to get that that young lady on this show or not. I can imagine the line I would have to get behind to do so. But yeah, let's let's uh, let's support Greta because her generation is going to need all the support they can get. That's right. Get a new hashtag. Uh, we're with Greta. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
anyway, with that, guys, we global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse momentarily uh, on the on the batteries of this camera. So, but before we go, Neil Dahl, I really uh, appreciate you reconsidering the invitation to come here on uh, Collapse Chronicles and finding an hour in your schedule to come talk to us about the state of the planet. And all I can say from here on out is keep up the good fight. Thanks, Sam. Bye, guys.